My name is Christine Booker, and welcome to our Armchair Safari to Africa, to travel with a purpose. I'm excited to share my Africa, its wildlife and its people with you, and perhaps dispel some of the myths around this great continent, and maybe even create some new ones. I'm overwhelmed and grateful for everyone who has joined us here today. We have quite the international audience, it seems. Why don't you put into the chat where you are from? And also, if you've been to Africa before, what your favorite spot is. The chat window is for oohs and ahs and anything like that you might want to share with all the other participants. If you have a question, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you scroll over that with your mouse, send us a question and we'll do our best to get to it in the Q&A time allotted after Peter's presentation. I realize that there are many industry colleagues online with us today. I welcome you. I'm honored to have you here and I would appreciate it if there was please no solicitation in the chat box. Africa holds a special place in my heart. And if you've ever set foot on, on her soil, she will have touched you in the most amazing ways. An African safari is like, unlike any other journey you will have ever taken. I guarantee you that the spirit of Africa and its people will touch you. That Africa awakens you in ways that you never knew possible and that Africa just gets under your skin. Everyone deserves to visit Africa at least once. Isn't it your turn soon? I am Christine Booker, and as you would have heard from my accent, I am from South Africa. My earliest safari memories of that are that of our, four of our parents loading us four children into the back of a station wagon, along with a clatter of pots and pans and provisions and that old canvas tent that you see in the top left of your screen. Off we went to the bush, often it was in Kruger Park or in the game reserves in KwaZulu-Natal. My parents had a deep love and respect for nature and I soon followed in their, foot, in their footsteps. I now call Vancouver Canada home and am so grateful that I can share my Africa with other travelers so that they can experience what I have lived for many years there. So this is my first webinar and I'm obviously not very good at multitasking. One of the things I'm really proud of is our Spread the Smile project where we support um, a company in East Africa that makes soccer balls from local leather and we can then donate those soccer balls to orphanages or to school children that um, often will play with a, a, a bunch of plastic bags wrapped up in string, as you can see my daughter holding there. So we replace that ball um, with a good leather soccer ball and we do that all over East Africa at the moment. Anybody who travels with us, we offer that service and it's, it just makes wonderful memories. I apprenticed in my uncle's travel agency many moons ago and have since then taken many specialist courses. I've also had the pleasure and the privilege to attend travel industry trade events all over the world. And here I met the most forward thinking industry leaders who all have one thing in common, a strong commitment to sustainability and to nature conservation. My happiest moments are at work are when my clients come back from a trip and they are over, over the moon with their experiences and the memories that they brought back. 
who would have thought that my friend and client, Susan, would have enjoyed going down the rapids in a canoe with her nephew. But it is one of those memories that she treasures. As a token for my immense gratitude for you taking the time and joining us today, everyone on this call will receive a treasure chest filled with um, travel related information and goods. I call it the Traveler's Toolkit. What's inside this toolkit? Well, you'll have to wait until the end of the presentation to find out what exactly is inside. So do stay till the end. There's a wonderful surprise for you there as well. It seems like we all have to stay home a little longer. And yet that doesn't mean that we can't stop dreaming about traveling to Africa or anywhere else for that matter in the future. Put in the chat window, please, what you would like to see on your trip to Africa. Our armchair safari is here to give you innovative ideas, to inspire your wanderlust, and to give you insights of how you can travel in the future, away from the crowds and off the beaten track. Who better then uh, to talk to, this, to you about this than Peter Allison, safari guide and author of the book, Whatever You Do, Don't Run. Will you please come on, Peter, and unmute yourself? There he is. Hello, Peter. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Hello, Christine. Thanks for arranging this. Uh, you're very uh, welcome. Thank you to everybody that's uh, joined in today. I see a few friends here, Cliffy, Disco, uh, amongst others, I'm sure. Um, I didn't see all the names as they came in. Um, Christine, did you want me to take over now? I just wanted to quickly introduce those people that don't know you, introduce you to those that don't know you yet. Um, I would say that you're a devoted father first now and devoted conservationist second. <laughs> would that be right? Uh, after quite a time in lockdown, thank you, Laura, for the, uh, Laurie, sorry, for the advice. Um, I'm pretty ready to make my children an endangered species. <laughs> um, if you hear them in the background, I beg forgiveness. They're not allowed outside. Uh, I, I really base, wish they'd fire base, up so yeah. I could send them outside from a great height. Anyway, I, I know that everybody else is going through something similar. We all have stresses we didn't imagine a while back. Uh, hopefully, what you hear this evening or this morning, wherever time zone you might be in, uh, takes you to somewhere far away with wide, wide open spaces. Yes, so I was going to say that uh, we met about four or five or even longer years ago uh, when you came into our office to introduce your new company, The Natural Selection. Um, and the last time we saw each other um, was when you braved the cold in January to come into the office to do a presentation to some of my top clients. And yeah. they loved it so much, I thought I'd bring you back and... Uh, let you take over and go for it, Peter. Let's hear what you right. have to share. Okay, so this, this is in two parts. If you let me share my screen, please, Christine. Um, I'm going to speak in two parts tonight. The first is serious or a little bit serious, um, mainly about conservation and how that works with tourism. And the next bit is silly, which I am far more qualified to talk about the silly. And um, Christine mentioned I work with for a company called Natural Selection, a very new company in terms of only being four years old. We co own and operate safari camps so far in three African countries Namibia, Botswana, and South Africa. We also lead trips into Angola. Um, we don't sell directly 
to people. That's not our job. Our job is to make sure you have a great experience on the ground. We prefer to work with experts in Africa. And this picture here, I think, says why you want to talk to an expert. I'm not going to dwell on this. Uh, this is not the, the evening for that. Africa is misrepresented on max, uh, maps. It's the way the projection is done. It is absolutely enormous. Don't go thinking it's a tiny place that you can skim around. See a, the smallest possible area and get to know it well, and then you'll come back and back and back again. It is not the trip of a lifetime. It's the, the trip you're going to do again and again. I came to Africa on a short trip in 1994, and until recently was still there. Uh, I've become a COVID refugee, and I'm now sitting 800 meters from where Charles Darwin was born in a little town called Shrewsbury in the UK. Um, just to give you a quick idea as to who we are, I've got a video. I'm hoping it plays well. It's very relevant to the time and allows me to take a sip of my drink because it is well past 6 p.m. here. Let me see if I can get this to work. Oops. Ah, I tried to read the chat box. Ah. Really... <laughs> Sorry. But... So I'll, I'll bring this forward. There we go. Unfortunately, there is no sound. So, if you if you thought that we had a um, a problem, it's just that there's, there's very that dramatic music. Hmm? It's, it's such a pity you don't have sound. The music is very, very dramatic, very emotional. You're <laughs> well, all crying right now. Singing. You just don't, don't know it. That's <laughs> going to put you off any trip to Africa. My singing, as once described, is sounding like a fox's fart. Um, so, just to, to finish off uh, on that, uh, I normally don't rely on video, but that just came out today and I, I really love it. It's, it's as much about the wide open spaces that you see in that, that I think everybody's craving at the moment. Um, but I just wanted to talk about conservation a bit here. I, I presume that anybody here this evening, today, is interested in wildlife, is interested in wild spaces, and therefore wants to preserve them. Just as if you love art, you don't want to see museums burning down. And maybe you speak to people who don't understand that and say, why would you give your money to animals? And there's a lot more of them uh, than you think of. Uh, there's analysis done of charity giving and here I'm sitting in the UK and the same in the US less than one cent out of every dollar given to charities by corporates and by individuals goes to wildlife for that little so that's an extra far more goes to ballet than goes to elephants and 
I put the elephant on here is just a, it's one of many, many examples you can use to talk to people about how important wildlife is and conservation is. Uh, this little elephant I saw out of a place called Juana Valley Camp late last year. And when this photograph was taken, it was six days old. And you, you can't quite see this photo. Its umbilical cord was still hanging down. This is fresh out of the package, absolutely adorable. And obviously it's grown since then. This is not that elephant. It grows and to do that, its cells have to divide, um, more cells created. But when that elephant was born, it weighed as much as a front row forward in rugby or a, one of your bigger hockey players if you're in Canada. Um, I'd make a soccer thing, but I don't think they grow them very big. I don't know much about soccer, football. Um, basically, we're talking about 120 kilos at birth after a 22 month pregnancy. An elephant's cells are no bigger than yours or mine. And way back in the 1960s, it was noticed that these elephants, not just elephants, but all large animals have normal sized cells. There's no great variance in cell size. And yet, think of how many cells are in this elephant's body. But the one thing they could not find a record of an elephant dying from was cancer. As I said, first noticed 50 years ago, and it was only in 2017 that a pediatric oncologist out of Salt Lake City called Dr. Joshua Schiffman, sitting in Utah, read of this, elephants don't die from cancer. And then there's a, there's a key way that I've worded that there, is that they don't die from cancer. Doesn't mean they don't get it, but we didn't even know that then. And he, this struck him. He's working with sick children all day, desperate to save them. And there was a traveling circus in town and he went to them and asked if he could draw blood from one of their elephants. And they let this uh, crazy request through, which I think is amazing. Um, and he took blood from it and went and researched the blood. And in it, he found a compound called P53. P53 is something that he was familiar with because we have this protein in our bodies. We have two types of it. And what we know of it is that as tumors form, when cells begin to divide uncontrollably, P53 attacks them. In elephant's blood, he counted more than 30 varieties, and that was on his first sweep. And they had different ways of attacking tumors. And off the back of this, a different researcher in Santa Fe in New Mexico uh, discovered that elephants have something unrelated in their blood that attacks leukemia as it forms. Somebody then did crossover research with the hyrax, a little rabbit-sized animal, also known as a dassie, uh, that we know shared an ancestor with elephants. And they discovered that the dassie or hyrax does not have these compounds. So the elephant had developed them with its great size. To get great size, you need to be able to fight cancer. So elephants do get cancer. They get it every single day. They just beat it. And knowing that they're looking to synthesize this, and it can be done without harming elephants, that's the good news. But the reason that this is so important is that each and every day we lose species. We lose plants, we lose small animals, um, occasionally we lose big animals. Life has been on Earth for 3.2 billion years. And every single thing we see around us today is a successful experiment. And it's an ongoing experiment. It has faced trials and tribulations from continents dividing, earthquakes, meteors from the sky, and it's made it through. But it doesn't mean it's perfect. It just means it's a survivor. So every time we lose a species, it's like we burn down a laboratory without getting its results. And an elephant is one such laboratory, as is every single living thing, be it a, a form of bacteria, be it a virus like COVID-19. These are all things that have gone through multiple changes. So when somebody asks, why does it matter if we don't have elephants? It's because elephants perhaps hold the key to saving their life or the life of somebody that they love. They are so incredibly important as is every living thing. And that is a huge part of what we do. I started out as a safari guide just because I liked watching animals. And the more I learn about them, the more and more I love them. I thought I already loved animals, but 
it's, it's like any relationship got more involved, got more passionate. And so one of the things I'm really proud of that natural selection does is we give one and a half percent of our turnover, not profit, before we even look at profit, before our shareholders get a sniff of profit, we give one and a half percent of revenue to conservation. And some of these projects are fairly um, boring. Uh, they're really hard to make sexy, but they're important. Research then leads, you gotta do the research before you can figure out where to put the money. But one that I love takes place in the Northern Okavango Delta, based out of a village called Aretza. Just over a thousand people there. And in 2018, three people from that community were killed by elephants. So in terms of population, that means more people there died from elephants than died in the US from smoking in the same year. So it's a major public health issue. We did the simplest thing, 41,000 US dollars was all it took and we bought two minivans. We've hired the staff, we maintain these vehicles. And with those vehicles, we are able to do the school run and every single, there's 176 school aged children in that village at last count gets taken. They, they, prior to this, they were walking eight or 12 kilometers to neighboring villages, um, Betza and Gonsihwa. And that's a bloody long way through an area that 40,000 elephants move through each year and has the highest concentration of lions in the Okavango Delta. That's what these kids had to go through. And, and we think we've got stress when the school bus is late or it's raining. So putting this bus in alleviates human wildlife conflict. Off the back of those three deaths, the villagers killed a number of elephants and I, I honestly don't blame them. Um, every single year they go through a crisis similar to what we're going through now, where elephants raid their crops and takes away their year's salary. So. For us putting these in, it sounds like it's just a straight benefit to the community, but it's actually, it's direct conservation of wildlife. And it also makes us good neighbors and they begin to see the direct benefits from wildlife tourism and land being held aside for elephants. So all of this might sound, you know, so what? What about me sitting at home, wherever you might be? And I saw some places I'd love to visit on the chat box earlier. When you come on safari, you're immediately a conservationist. Straight away, you are giving back. But more importantly that, you're telling a government in Botswana, in Namibia, Kenya, Tanzania, Congo, wherever you might go, that land with wild animals in it is worth more than land with agricultural mining. Because those are our true competitors. It's not other safari companies. We're actually all collaborators. We're all partners and, and quite often friends. Um, so this is a, please come on safari. If you want to give back, when you can come on safari, if you can donate to a really good charity, please do while you're sitting at home. I understand it's tough times for everybody. Um, so this is, uh, I'm, there's no expectation based on what I'm saying. Um, but just so you know what we're doing, we are still running that bus. We have zero revenue right now. The old 20 of our properties are shut, the borders are closed, people can't get in even if they wanted to. We're running programs around the areas where we work. Uh, this is taken right by Juanid Valley Camp in a community called Sesfontaine uh, this week. And this is our, one of our camp managers who's grown a particularly impressive beard since I last saw him. And some of the staff, giving food out to the local communities and just some of the feedback from the people there. And I've had every single day for the past few months has been as bad as the worst day I had at work last year. It's been going on for months. And yesterday I had my first good day at work in ages because this came in. And it was just, I thought this is why we're doing it. And it just made it all worthwhile. We're gonna get through this as a company and we'll be able to do more good work. But just right now to think, some of the most disadvantaged and hard done by people. Well, they were hard done by before COVID hit. We're able to do good work by them. And I'm, I'm just so proud of the people I work with and uh, what they're doing uh, to actually see this. It, it really does warm my heart. And again, this is what you do when you come to, to Africa is you support these sorts of endeavors. You might not even know about the good work you do 
just coming through. And Christine is doing by sending people to responsible companies. Um, so when you come through, you're helping to save people. You're helping to save species that are endangered or might not be. Every single thing on your screen here, and not just the animals, the grass, the bushes, hold some secret we haven't unlocked yet. Modern medicine's barely a hundred years old. In World War I, more people died from infections than died from bullets. We didn't have penicillin yet, and that's natural. You know, that's, that's came from a, a fungus floating through a window. Yeah, it's all out here. Aspirin came from plants. Uh, great white sharks, we know, or sharks, I should say in general, also don't appear to get cancer. They're doing it some other way. Uh, whales, they've just started to look at. Um, who knows what cheetahs have, and they're on the edge. Rhinos, as you know, are being wiped out. Hippos, we only recently learned, have an entire language that we were unaware of. It's happening underwater. It's, we're still learning so much, and they hear it through their jaws. They have an audio nerve that runs from their jaws up into their brain. We are still at the tip of the spear in our knowledge of wildlife and, and what there is left to learn. So please come on safari, get enthralled, fall in love, and then you'll become part of this family that wants to protect these amazing and some of the last truly wild places in the world. Uh, so that's the last of my serious bit. I don't know, Christine, if you wanted to jump in before I get into a silly story of a midget in my backside and a generator. So oh, I'm, I'm just mesmerized as I can see everybody else is. So uh, over to you. <laughs> okay, so... The story I tell now is about an unfortunate incident, um, and I don't want it to scare anybody off. Um, there's, Africa's probably the most mismarketed continent. Somebody years back, I'm gonna guess an English person, called it the dark continent. And I really want them to count numbers of days of sunlight in each place. Africa is filled with color from this chameleon which I took in my backyard in Cape Town when I lived there not so long ago. Uh, extraordinary place, color, vibrancy, light, and it is not dark, it is not dank, and it's not dangerous. I actually think on safari you are safer than you are in any city in the world. Uh, I've run an informal study, and the number of tourists who die on safari is a fraction of those who die visiting Paris, New York, Sydney, it's not tourism, it's not terrorism related, anything like that. Um, and you might think that this is going on safari, is staying in a little dome tent. Camping is really what you want it to be, what your, your desire or your budget is. This is a property we opened in June last year. I absolutely love it, and normally I, I'm not into the more blingy camps but it's just, it has so much space. And again, that's I think the thing we all crave right now is just space to be social or to be private. It shouldn't be a luxury, but right now it is for all of us. Food of the Wacky, I bloody love. This is one of my favorite places in the world, even without one of my favorite properties in the world. And this is the Skeleton Coast National Park. There is only one place to stay in an entire national park in the second driest place in the world. Um, and that's the kind of safaris you run. So when we come on safari, most people are coming for wildlife. They want to see an elephant, they want to see a leopard, um, switch their focus, whichever's in the foreground. Over time, they get more fascinated. Once they've seen the fur and the fangs, fascinating things like the secretary bird, my favorite bird, um, and one of the only scientific names worth knowing, it's Sagittarius serpentarius which just means snake hunter, uh, Sagittarius the hunter. Um, and then also the people. I think a key element that many safaris miss is the people. And documentaries also miss this. Documentaries promote this idea that Africa is a sea of wildlife with small pockets of humanity, and it's quite the opposite. It's little islands of wilderness surrounded by humans crowding in. And meeting those people is key. And the reality is that, that on the edges of reserves is where the conservation work is done. The sand people, this is a Bushman lady here, uh, one of the longest, along with Australian Aborigines, longest 
contiguous cultures in the world, the fewest changes, you're meeting human time capsules when you spend time with them. Please don't focus a safari just on sitting in a vehicle and having things shown to you. You've got to get out. Your feet have got to touch Africa. It's, it's not going to bite. And you're going to be with experts that know what they're doing. Um, I hope if you've booked well. <laughs> um, so just to, to, to get into the story, starting in 1994, I was a safari guide. My main job was driving a vehicle like this. I was about that age. It's the person behind the wheel here. I was 19 when I began uh, 26 years ago. But then I made a dreadful mistake and I became a camp manager somehow thought that that was the next promotion and when you're a camp manager nobody talks to you when they're happy when you're a guide everybody says that was amazing we had so much fun um when you're a camp manager they tell you that the toilet is broken or the water is hot in their shower and um you know, there's uh, you're not the hero anymore and i was working in northern botswana and in northern botswana it's a very tectonically active area and most stories you get here are going to be about the Okavango Delta. There's also an amazing place called the Mahadi Hadi Pans. Uh, Chobi National Park is well known. But there's a little channel called the Savuti River, which is misnamed. Um, you can see that there's a, I love this. This image came, it's not a satellite image. It was taken from the International Space Station. The Delta is prominent, but flowing into it is, or flowing towards it, I should say, is a dry, river called the Savuti Channel. And this is not really either, but I wanted to represent what it looks like. It's a river that switches on and off quite randomly until 1980. It had been dry for about 30 years. Prior to that, it flowed for about 100. David Livingston had commented on it when he came through in the uh, mid-ish 1800s. Um, and then it was dry from the 1980s through to, I think it was 2014. Cliffy, I know you're here, you'll know the exact years, and I'll be ashamed of me for not remembering them. Um, but this river switches on and off. It seems to be due to tectonics, could also be water flow out of Angola, which pushes into these areas. Um, but nevertheless, you have a, a river that can run for a decade, switch off for a hundred years, then flow for a hundred years and dry up for three. And right in front of a camp I worked at called Savuti Camp was a waterhole. And it was an absolute magnet for wildlife. But <clears throat> the big bullies were the elephants. They would be there. And overnight, they would flatten this, making it really difficult for the other wildlife to get in. And I'm absolutely cheating here. None of these photos are from Savuti. This was back in the 90s. Any photo I took was on slide. These are more modern. This was taken from a place called Menelokwena which has a, it's on a, a, the Bateti River, which does the same thing, which is on and off. But these are these amazing scenes you get of wildlife piling in to grab what water they can. Um, and of course, it wasn't just herbivores. Lions have to drink as well. They would come down. So there was this parade. It was it's one of the best places I know not to go on game drive, to stay in camp and let the animals come to you. But one of my favorite animals there was a fish eagle. And we just, with zero imagination, called him Mr. Fish. But what was extraordinary was the main nearest body of water, big, big body of water, was almost 10 kilometers away. And this fish eagle didn't fly to it. And fish eagles, like a lot of eagles, can live into their 40s. They're a very, very long-lived bird. They typically do partner up and mate for life. But presumably this fish eagle had lived there since the 1980s. We were talking almost two decades later now. Uh, it was the late 90s I'm describing. And he lived over this water hole and we pumped into it. We pumped water to it. So every day he would watch his territory dwindle and dwindle as the elephants and other animals drank from it. And then every afternoon as we pumped to it and morning, he'd see it expand and expand. And I presumed he was just waiting for the day that it was a full river again, and maybe he could pick up a nice girl who was passing through. Um, fish eagles, like most species, really into real estate. He lived in a crap neighborhood, so he couldn't find a new wife. Um, but he sat there every day, and un the name would suggest they eat fish, they will when they're available. He was picking off the game birds, Franklins, which would come in, 
um, the monitor lizards that would come through, small mammals, he was eating what he could. Um, but as I said, elephants were the main stars of the show here. This water hole, <clears throat> come in, scratch their backsides, have a drink. The problem was, we didn't have enough vehicles for me to fire up the generator every afternoon. So the guests would set off on their afternoon safari and I had to wait till they were gone because the generator was noisy. It's an old diesel generator called a Lister. And if you spent time on a farm or are on a farm or know the Lister generator, it's work of the devil. And I had to cross the dry riverbed right past that water hole and desperate animals to get this thing started. And I knew that just at the sound of it beginning, elephants with, who have extraordinary hearing, you'd want to with ears that big, I imagine Prince Charles could hear it too, they would know that this generator was starting and they would begin to pour in en masse. So if I didn't get it started and back across the channel, the dry riverbed, I'd have to pick my way between literally, literally hundreds of elephants with zero exaggeration. And if I didn't get it fired up and the water hole was dry, that night the elephants would come into camp and trash all of our plumbing looking for water. They'd push over the geysers outside the guest tents because they knew that they would drain. It would drain the whole 10,000 litre tank. They would drink it dry and later another elephant would come and push over some other geyser, not realising they were empty. So I had the choice of getting this job done or the next day having to re-plumb an entire camp and I am absolutely rubbish at maintenance. No idea what I'm doing. So I needed to get these elephants in and back into camp in a short amount of time. There were many impediments in my way. Small wildlife. When people say, what's the most scared you've ever been on safari? We typically tell a tale of lions, of a buffalo, bloody buffalo, they're horrible. Um, but the most scared you've actually ever been is when you are creeping through the bush, trying to keep an eye open for lions, and something small like a bat-eared fox springs out in front of you. There's a lot of fecal matter in the bush and a lot of it's from guides. Um, and when you know that happens, that bird, the Franklin I mentioned, they have caused more heart attacks than cheeseburgers. When you're out tracking and they go chuck, 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 right from your feet. Um, it, it scares all sorts of organs out of you. So I had to cross this channel. Oh, I've made it across with no incident on this particular occasion. And there was another villain in this piece, which is this guy, Baboons. The most entertaining animal to watch in the book, perhaps second most entertaining after elephants. One of my favorite animals to watch on safari, one of my least favorite animals when they're in camp. If they learn to lose a fear of humans, they are incredibly destructive, they're incredibly smart. Anybody that thinks we are the most intelligent species on the planet has never tried to stop a baboon from entering their dwelling. You only ever play defense. Everything you ever do is in reaction to what they're doing. You're never, ever one step ahead. Books could be written about that. But if we just left the generator exposed, they would pull off the fan belt type thing over the flywheels. They would chew on all of the soft rubber nipples for oiling it, and that is what they're called, not being moderately obscene. Uh, they would just trash it because they can. They're vandals. So because of that, the generator was kept in a cage, corrugated iron roof, heavy wire mesh around it, padlock on it because they can work a bolt, a slide bolt. So I have to go and I'd unlock this and believe me, you only forget the keys once. Then I'd go up and I would unlock the cage, I'd get in and whoever built this cage was vindictive, short-sighted and a midget because it was, I'm 5'9", I'm, I'm not tall, but this thing was set to almost the exact dimensions of the generator, which meant that to get into it, you had to absolutely crouch over with this sharp thing digging into your back, and then you picked up a big heavy cast iron handle, you put it on and you went, boop, 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 boop. it was cranked like an ancient, ancient car from you know, 100 years ago. And then once it caught, you had to get that handle off as fast as you could because otherwise it started spinning at the speed of the generator and you had a chunk of cast iron would fly off and chase you as you were running away. So, and if that thing hits you there, that was more dangerous than any animal out there. 
So I got it as a I pulled the handle off and went So I was upset and put it back on. And just that sound I knew would be enough. Elephants kilometers away were on their way. And the elephants closer by were already there. So I put it back on again. And I was more nervous, so probably a bit too nervous. So I pulled the handle off too soon, yet again. Um, been told that before. And pulled it off and took, 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 And I know, yeah, I was cursing my job. I was cursing the midget that built the cage. I was cursing the baboons that made the cage necessary. I was cursing the elephants, my favorite animal. And I put it back on and I realized that I was being an idiot and I should just squat down. Um, and for some reason, I have a picture of a buffalo here. I can't remember why. Uh, I think probably because that's the thing I was most afraid of, having to cross back. Put the handle back on. And as I went to squat down, I was just wearing a shirt, probably similar to what I've got on now, shorts, um, and just what we call straps, which is a somewhere between, a, like a sandal with a, a flip-flop with a heel on the back of it, um, like Crocs, but you can actually have sex if you're wearing them, somebody won't be repulsed. Um, I'm not going to carry on with that stream of thought. So I put the handle back on, squatted down. What I hadn't realized was that crawling up my heel was a scorpion. Thank goodness it wasn't this. This is a type called a parabutus, which is one of the most toxic scorpions uh, around in the world. Um, this is a relative of this though in the family Butidae. A thick tail and skinny pincers mean that scorpion relies mainly on its venom. And this thing had crawled up the back of my sand and all it saw was a looming moon when no moon was due. And scorpions don't take to threats very well. So back it cocked. And it got me in, I don't know why I'm being polite now, but let's just call it the upper, upper thigh. And I did what any sensible person will do when squatting down and stung by a scorpion in the backside is I jumped up. The problem was I was inside the midget cage or half in. So I jumped up, banged my head on the top of the corrugated roof. I managed to crank the generator enough that it fired because I was, I was starting in on the things. I'd get such a hard crank. Fortunately, the handle came off. I then fell sideways onto now spinning belts, which tore my shirt off because of a Britney Spears at about the same era, late 90s, but took the skin with it, which is quite a bit less attractive. And I, it, I don't know if I, I was certainly, I think I was knocked out, but I certainly felt like I came to and I was lying inside a metal cage with a diesel generator, a saw head stripped skin off my belly, my skin scraped on my back from the, the side of the cage. And it, fire like somebody had taken a red hot poker and stabbed me in the backside and you imagine that this would all happen in the space of a second or two and i was saying what the hell happened and then out came the scorpion pincers up tail back there's always things saying well i've clearly taken round one let's go again and i'm a conservationist through and through as i've explained i, I everything i do is because i love animals um i could have a <laughs> not work in ecotourism i could have a real job um and you know, make that stuff called money. But I do this because I really hope that each day I save animals. And yet I reached for my pocket knife and I was gonna be a very bad conservationist. And I gently pulled it out of its little Velcro pouch thingy. And I was there working out the blade. And I'd got the blade open and I was doing about my first sit up in however many years. I leant forward, the scorpion came towards me. I leant forward further, the scorpion came towards me. My abs were creaking because I didn't have any. Pulled my arm back and this thing ran under the generator and was gone. And again, I cursed the scorpion, the midget, the elephants, the baboons, everything. And I had to stop the generator, put the belt back on, and then get it all going, crank it up, fire it up, grab the threads of my shirt that were lying there, dab at the skin, realize that was a bad idea. And then I 
stepped out knowing, and there were the elephants streaming in, and it should have been a magnificent sight. And I was honestly just ready to walk back in, ready to the office and say, that's it, I'm done. I've been doing that enough years, almost 10 years by that point. I think I'm done. I'm going to go and be a normal human being. And as I stepped out and the water began to pump out, the fish eagle called, threw his head back and gave this call. And it is one of the greatest sounds in Africa, the call of the fish eagle. And in all the years, 26 years of being on safari as a guide and as a guest, I've derived so much pleasure from animals. And that is, I, to this day, I think the only time I feel like an animal's gained pleasure from my actions. And it was just this wonderful moment where it just all felt okay. I still had a dance of death to get through the elephants, but I'd made an animal happy. And I was absolutely thrilled by that. But if I'd had longer arms, the scorpion was still dead. Um, that's pretty much it from me. I feel that that there is the perfect end or perfect ends. Christine, if you'd like to wind up or open up for questions. Um, Peter, what a story. Um, everybody, I think, was riveted. The chat box was going crazy. Um, I'm so glad the scorpion made it out alive. And, <laughs> and so still. did you to tell the tale. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and so I, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you should be battling your children right now with bath time. And I, and I so appreciate you taking this time um, and, and sharing your stories with us, which are just so amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody for logging in and, and really uh, do hope we can see you all out in Africa. If you wouldn't mind unsharing, or actually I'll do that now. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, me out. And I'll go back to, to my screen here. Can you see my little leopard with a thank you to you? Yes, we can. Excellent. Well, I think it's time for for question and answers now. I'm sure there are a lot of questions that come up, that have come up while you were talking. And you're welcome to put them in the Q&A page if you like. Um, we've had two questions, both, both uh, addressed to you, Peter, for, for the moment. Um, when are you going back to Africa, was, the, was one of the questions. Marilyn asked that. When am I coming back to oh, um, I actually have a client who wants the bragging rights of being the first back into Africa, in Botswana specifically, when they open. And so as soon as Botswana opens their borders and allows safaris, um, I will be going uh, back, which I'm, I'm very excited by. Well, that's, you know, I, I can't wait. Uh, I, I would go tomorrow as soon as the borders open. And we don't have a crystal ball, so unfortunately, uh, we don't know when that is. Um, but Jennifer was asking, do you have any particular safaris planned for 2021 where you might be taking people as, uh, as a guide? I don't as yet. Um, I'm, you'll, you'll let me know, right? Once you have some yeah, dates, I and will. then I can I share will. that. In, in fact, the last time I was in Botswana was a trip that I'd led, uh, an open group trip, end of February, beginning of March. And we were all sitting in camp saying, aren't people funny the way they're re overreacting to this COVID thing? Yeah. Uh, that, that was, uh, we finished that trip March 3rd, so... What are we in? Look, we're in end of May now. It's crazy. Yeah. How the world has changed. Who would have thought yeah. that everything could come to a stop by a tiny little virus? Yeah. So, so here we are. Um, Ma Madeline says, when is your next book out, please, Peter? Um, that's a great question, Madeline. I did actually recently start doing some writing again, not necessarily for a book, might just be some stories released one by one digitally. But that was as lockdown was first kicking in. And um, we, 
I hadn't realized that it's not just that I'd be keeping a full-time job, that I'd be incredibly busy with it while my wife and I also opened an impromptu daycare because we had two toddlers at home. So our kids are about to turn two and four and they understandably don't comprehend mommy and daddy are working. So we kind of tag team with them throughout the day, which means your work day gets cut in half when we're incredibly busy. So that's my excuse for not writing much. I've started a bunch of stories. I'm hoping that I'll finish one or two of them soon and I'll just drip feed them out a bit. Um, but there's also the possibility of some writing for TV coming up soon. I'm hoping to be, have some exciting news on that soon. And, and your books, are they available on Amazon? They are. Um, I see that question from Chris Newell there. Yes. Yeah. On which country you're in, Chris? Um, Chris is here from Vancouver. She's a, oh, okay. a fellow listen, birder, listen. actually. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. And yeah. she uh, went to Botswana not so long ago. Fantastic. That Botswana is what made me a birder. Um, Amazon.ca has them. I know that. Um, otherwise, your local bookstore, when it reopens, will be able to order them. I, I, I love being able to support bricks and mortar book, bookstores. Um, but yeah, Amazon as well. Um, and then, so Joshua, I see your story there. It is possible to break in a garden without Fagasa, though it's harder and harder to do that. And it's less to do with your qualifications these days with guiding and more to do with your ability to get a visa. Um, unfortunately, that, that's the battle I've had for 20 something years. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, if you want to contact me about that directly via my Facebook page, I'll be happy to give you a longer answer than that. Thank you, Peter. So that's all we have for questions right now. And so what I want to say is that as you've heard, um, every decision you make is taking a vote for the planet. Thank you very much for explaining that so well to us, Peter. Uh, we are both strong proponents of conservation and I love listening to you speak and I love the passion with which you bring it and how you, how you personalize it because the word conservation um, sounds to some like, uh, I could never do it, but yes, we can. We can absolutely um, choose a responsible way to travel so that we can share some of our riches with those people and those countries that we, that we travel to. So thank you again for sharing that. And thank you everybody for being on the call with us. I thought to help you choose um, and make the right choice for your next trip, I would offer you a free 30 minute discovery call with me, uh, depending on whether you qualify, obviously, whether, whether this would work for you. I would like to create a bucket list vision board based on sustainable tourism. And to, in order to get that, I'm going to put this, uh, a link into the chat form and you can fill out a questionnaire. Once you filled out the questionnaire, you will get the Traveler's Toolkit anyway, but you may also receive, um, qualify for time with me to create this bucket list uh, vision board for you. So this is the, um, the URL that I'll put into the chat form now. Um, this offer is available until 5 p.m. this afternoon here in Vancouver or on the West Coast or 8 p.m. Eastern. I haven't quite worked out what the other time zones would be. So it's available for the next five hours. And if you'd like to go and fill in the form, I'll put it in the chat window just now and uh, hopefully I can help you put together this wonderful bucket list all based on sustainable tourism. Thank you again for joining us. Peter, if you have any last words that you would like to share. Uh, no, just again, thank you. And you know, there, there, there's a great opportunity um, to be a conservationist and have the best holiday of your life or vacation, whatever word you choose. Um, 
you got a book with an expert, Christine is undoubtedly one to, to get the right sort of trip. Um, and if you've got questions about travel and how to book it, Christine's the person to speak to. If you've got questions about wildlife, I'm available on most forms of social media, though I, I forget to check Twitter. Thank you very much, Peter.